The history of secret services is as old as the world itself. From Sun Tzu of China, India's Chanakaya, the ancient Egyptians, and even Hebrews in the story of Rahab, everything has been documented very well. There were spies and secret services in the Greek and Roman civilizations. Feudal Japan used ninjas for these purposes. There has never been a successful political system in the history of all civilizations where a crucial and critical part was not played by its secret service. Modern espionage has its beginnings in Elizabethan England. The man who created it was Sir Francis Walsingham. From that point on, the methods have changed along the way. But the goal has always remained the same, to find out what the enemy is thinking, what their plan is, and how to surprise and stop them. The key person when it came to planning any action was, of course, the agent. Whether it was the British MI5, MI6, German Secret Service, Soviet KGB, or America's CIA, it was always the individual whose abilities determined the success of any agency and any given mission. The names such as Matahari, Kim Philby, Sidney Riley, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Richard Sorge, Klaus Fuchs, all became famous. Some have served as great storylines used in movies, and not just the ones about James Bond. The secret activities, and many, oftentimes never proven, stories about unbelievable actions which genuinely occurred, sounded like familiar stories seen in films. Yet these stories really happened, involving real people with real consequences. This is a story about Rafi Aitan the most famous agent of Israel's Mossad. According to many, the most successful secret service of the modern age. The story behind the capture of Adolf Eichmann, one of the most notorious Nazi war criminals, is one of those unbelievable and fascinating stories whose every detail is true. The hero of this story is Rafi Aitan. Rafi Eitan was born in one of the most famous kibbutz in Israel called En Harod in 1926. After serving in the Palmach, he joined the uh, secret services. And at that time, the Mossad and the Shabak were a uh, united organization. He was the first commander, the first leader of the operation units. In the early stages of the State of Israel, technological-wise, budget-wise, it was very, very poor. Rafi really is the founder of the very, very, very imaginatory operation uh, uh, unit of the Shabak and the Mossad. After Less than 10 years, he was, of course, the leader of the Eichmann operation in Buenos Aires, that books were written on the operation, and it all is human and hand-making. It's not something that you are uh, telling, well, we had some uh, technological cover and telephone cover, etc. It's all marching by foot, all thinking how to manipulate a very, very complicated operation in a foreign country that at that time wasn't the greatest friend of Israel. Catching him, holding him, 
and bringing him back to Israel was a uh, genius uh, operation headed or leaded by Rafi. Rafi Aitani is a symbol in our country. He is the man that he uh, worked hard for the country, for the security. He uh, was ready to give his life for the country, and everybody know in Israel who is Rafi Etan. What I can tell you now, I salute to his generation, I salute to his personally, and I graduate his life until 120, maybe if he want more and more. Rafi Etan, first of all, I think, is a man who loves life. He's a happy man uh, by his nature. Uh, an optimistic person. Surprisingly, considering the fact that he is now over 90, he is as sharp and as focused as I remember him uh, 35 years ago. He is uh, a very smart, very calculated, very able man. After he retired from all his different positions over 25 years ago, he uh, started uh, business in, uh, first in Cuba and then in Africa and many other countries. So uh, you're talking about a very unique person, there is no question about it. He was a fighter, a great scientist, he was a gentleman. Not only a Zionist, but a gentleman, which is in my opinion one, one of the most important factors and manners wherever he is, whether in Israel or elsewhere, he was and he is still a gentleman. My father came from Belarus in 1923 and my mother from Saratov, Saratov on the Volga, Russia, also the same year. They uh, escaped through uh, Baku, Tbilisi, Istanbul, and then uh, Haifa, and they met on the way, and they uh, came to uh, Palestine at the time. They settled in a kibbutz with the name of En Harod. We are four, one sister, three brothers, and all of us in Israel. I was uh, grew up in a village at the time was called Ir Shalom. Today it's called Ramat Sharon. And at the time it was a very small village, isolated, about 100 families. Each family had uh, something like two, three hectares, four hectares of land. And my parents were farmers. The Israel at the time uh, was Palestine. I mean, my youth, we were uh, roughly about um, 300,000 or 400,000 Jewish people in Palestine. The majority were Arabs, also not so many uh, as today, but uh, they were the majority. In practice, that was the beginning of establishing the road to be one day a Jewish state. The most important uh, started from the Zionist organization in the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, 1917, came a Balfour Declaration by the British Empire at the time that uh, Jewish people has the right to establish their own state in Palestine uh, that we, at the time, immediately called Eretz Israel. That means the land of Israel. In 1948, Ben-Gurion declared the independence of Israel and uh, he also agreed to divide the country into two states, Arab state and the Jewish state. 
but the Arabs didn't agree. And therefore, in 1948, the war started, that uh, five Arab countries fought against the uh, Israeli settlements in Palestine at the time. And happily, we won the war. I was a soldier, an officer, during the independent war, that means up to 1950. And in 1950, I had to decide to stay in the military. I was already officer in the intelligence services of the army, and then I decided to go to the civilian intelligence organizations in 1951. Before the army, he was hit by a bomb and he was almost completely deaf. And to be almost deaf and to be a leader of such operations is something that you cannot find in the history of uh, intelligence organizations. He is a character and uh, no doubt a founder of the creativity of the Israeli intelligence. Despite the fact that he has long indebted Israel with his service to the country and its people, Rafi Aitan will forever be remembered by one of the most spectacular actions in the history of secret services. The unbelievable surveillance, arrest, and transfer to Israel of one of the most notorious Nazis, Adolf Eichmann. Up to 1957, the Mossad and the Israeli Shabak, that means equivalent to British MI5, MI6, the Israeli organizations, didn't do anything or almost anything to go to capture ex-Nazis. But in 1957, Ben Gurion ordered the head of the Mossad, Israel at the time, to bring one of the Nazi criminals to be brought into court in Israel. He said he stressed not to kill them, but to bring them to court in Israel. Then in 57, we started looking for ex-Nazis, generals or leaders. There were four or five names that were had priority, like uh, Mengele, Miller, Dorman, and also Eichmann. This was a decision of the Prime Minister at that time, Mr. ben Gurion, and the Cabinet. Eichmann was the symbol for the Holocaust, more than anyone else because he was in charge of the Nazis' plan to liquidate the Jewish people. He was in charge of the operation. He was in charge of all the machine that was built by the Nazi Germany at that time uh, with all the concentration camps, with all the logistic efforts to bring Jews from all over Europe into the concentration camps and to liquidate them. Therefore, he was the symbol there was no more persuasive and powerful way in which to present to the younger generation, the future generation, what has Germany done to the Jewish people, but through the focusing on one person who, by his own decisions and his own efforts, assembled all these different factions into a one operation that brought about the liquidation of six million Jews. Eichmann was the executor, the commander. He made the idea of race and exterminating Jews in Europe. He was the master. Israel had chased Nazi, who remained after the war, went out to South America, remained in Europe, because we have established a law which says that Israel will chase Nazis and it's the only 
law in Israel that a death sentence is possible. It happened that uh, in 1959, the information about Eichmann was uh, the best information that we had. We discovered all the details of Eichmann in the Argentine in January, February 1960. When we have discovered that Eichmann is possibly in Buenos Aires, in Argentine, Ben Gurion at that time, I said to Rafi, you are stopping everything, you are taking the best team that you can uh, uh, accomplish, and you are going to Argentine, and will ever, I mean, it will take several months or something, stop all operations. It's the most important, morally, and to show the world that Israel, after the Nazi regime and after the Holocaust is so creative, so capable and so strong to punish those who have exterminated six million out of our nation. I can identify with the enormous courage that uh, was manifested by Ben Gurion by deciding to do it, but at the same time I'm familiar with how things work from the minute that you decide to the minute that someone in the field carries out this operation and he does it with precision, with care, and with great success. And Rafi is amongst the very few top agents of the Israeli intelligence, historically, that can take pride in one of the most dramatic and most important, most significant operations of the Israeli intelligence ever. Any operations had also problems. Of course, we had few problems, but uh, at the end, uh, we uh, succeeded to overcome all the problems on the way, and uh, it's a fact that we succeeded. During the Second World War, the partisans, especially in Eastern Europe, the Jewish partisans also composed songs. And one of the songs said that in the future we shall win, and in the future our steps uh, will be in freedom and uh, we could say, Anachnu Po. That means, we are here. When uh, I uh, had the head of Eichmann on my knees in the car, I shook hand with my colleague and I felt, we are here. The Jewish people are here. Eichmann, uh, bringing to Israel was historical operation. And probably up to all operations that I took part, that uh, the only one uh, or the best one that will stay for history. Rafi's position was central. He was the guy that was the commander, the, the immediate commander, the field commander of the operation. He did it like he did many things, with uh, courage, with uh, professional ability of the highest order, no question about it, or with uh, great success. They identified Eichmann, they caught Eichmann, they uh, took him uh, into a secret place in Argentina, they coordinated the flight back. Nothing was known, no one could feel that there was something going on there until Ben Gurion announced uh, in the Knesset that Eichmann is in the hands of Israel. Eichmann. 
المشهم کرو بشم هپیترون هسفی شل بیت ایودیم It was like a, um, I wouldn't call it a victory, but it was something that showed that Israel is alive, Israel is a nation, Israel is capable, and Israel is capable to act, to operate in a foreign country. זה <אז> כלפי תא הזכוכית ולזעוק כלפי היושב שם אני מאשים מפני שעפרם נערם בין גבעות אושוויץ בשדות טרבלינקה נשטף בנהרות פולין וקבריהם פזורים על פני אירופה לאורכה ולרוחבה דמם זועק How did he feel during the trial of Eichmann in Jerusalem? I was there. I uh, watched him uh, hang. And I, I thought uh, to myself, uh, everybody, every Jewish survivor, anyone who survived the Holocaust and uh, watched it and... Uh, watch it on the TV, probably will be proud. I think it was the only case that a man or someone was hanged in Israel. This was Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi. And this will always be remembered by every Israeli for generations to come. He was in fact the head of what we call the Holocaust, when six million Jews lost their life in concentration camps in gas chambers in Europe. He was in charge of this operation. I think it's a, a historical event. I don't think that, from my recollection, anywhere in the history of mankind, six million people have been exterminated because of their belief because of their religion, just because they were Jews. This was the only reason. The only reason that they were exterminated, killed in concentration camps is because they were Jews. Never happened. And I hope that it will never happen in the future. And he was in charge of this operation. And no one can forget it. And no one will ever forget it. The uh, whole court was showing the world that Israel is doing justice not like the Nazis have been done with the Jewry in Europe. Adolf Eichmann is something uh, unique because uh, it represents all the Nazi forces. And uh, the moment that he brings him into Israel is uh, like uh, Israel uh, we solve the problem with the Nazis, and he is the symbol that we can put him in the trial in Israel and Jerusalem, and after that to, uh, to send him to the Mediterranean Sea. It is interesting to hear on what it takes and how one becomes an agent of Mossad by someone as notable as Rafi Aitan. First, they must be very honest people. The first thing that I'm uh, analyzing, looking to a new candidate, if he is really, by nature, a man with the 
full honesty. It's not one or two or three kind of characters. You, for the Mossad, could have many, many kinds of people. The Mossad is a good service and has a, a lot of achievements, but uh, to say the best, I wouldn't say it. One of the best. We are amongst the best in the world. The mythology is based on what is known and largely on what is speculated to have taken place, but without really knowing all the facts. A lot of these myths is built on a mystery, on what you don't know. When things are known, it is much less exciting because you know all the facts. When you don't know, there is always a lot of room for rumors, for speculations, for guessing. Over the years, the Mossad was involved in uh, many great events, some of which became known, and they nourished all the other things that are not known, but that people speculate about. For instance, one of the greatest achievements of Israeli intelligence was the uh, fact that we took hold of the uh, famous speech of uh, Khrushchev in 1956 after the death of Stalin and the renunciation of Stalin by Khrushchev and uh, the, the fact that we were the first to have it and we presented it to the American intelligence and they were absolutely stunned and that has created, started to create the myth about the unlimited abilities of the Mossad. The hands of the Mossad, the amount of intelligence, the bravery, the operational side is something that you cannot imagine. Of course, it's sometimes it's fantasies, but the truth is that the Mossad is um, quite capable and the amount of partnership that other uh, services wants with the Mossad is very big. So it gives the Mossad a range, a wide range of cooperation all over the world. And yes, the Mossad is known as a very efficient service and a very cold mind, very, very motivated, and an organization that works very efficiently for the state and for the state of Israel and for its interests. But the myth helps a lot. When you are coming and say, we are the Mossad, you are getting a lot of uh, honor and a lot of admiration, and it helps. And the Mossad is still very active. The latest operations were around Iran. We cannot tell what was there, but the one who reads newspaper can understand that the long end of Israel has reached some operational heroes of uh, Iran, and still the Mossad is very active and very successful, and I wish it will last. The Mossad, or the intelligence services of any country, today, the basic, the elements of security, without intelligence, without knowing what happening in the fields of your enemies, or in the fields even of your uh, friends, I would say. It's very difficult to keep uh, security for any country. When he was in charge of one of our intelligence services in 1985, there was a certain operation which was not authorized in the United States of America to collect certain intelligence data where for Israel, uh, this data does not relate to any European country or uh, any other country except for 
intelligence which relates to countries that are in conflict with Israel. And he was responsible for this unauthorized action. I was uh, appointed by the government to handle this matter. I cannot elaborate on the details for obvious reasons, but I must say that he assumed upon his himself full responsibility for this unauthorized act. When I say unauthorized, to collect any information whatsoever in the United States of America. I don't know many people who are ready who were ready or are still ready to assume responsibility. They always try to throw the responsibility on others. And I cannot forget it, and I will never forget that Rafi Eitan stood up and said, I am responsible. I did it for the security of the State of Israel, but it was unauthorized. Unauthorized to do it in the United States of America, against the policy of the Israeli government. But when you are in charge of certain operations and you are ready to assume responsibility in case that there is a mistake or an error. I don't know many people who are ready to assume responsibility for it. He was a one who took upon himself assumed responsibility. Not only that, he was not allowed to enter into the United States since then. He is a unique person. I know many people that they are responsible for certain operations, but they always try to say, well, I acted within authority, I did what I was expected to do. It's, it was not only me, it was others who knew or authorized, and he is a guy who said, I'm responsible. What advice would Rafi Aitan give to anyone who wishes to become an agent of the Mossad? Well, I say, if you like uh, uh, to be uh, in a very exciting world with the uh, adventures and uh, <laughs> to have to your many stories when you are a grandfather, join the Mossad. From 1948, the year of Israel's foundation, Rafi Aitan has socialized and been friends with the most important leaders of Israel. When you ask him who, in his opinion, is the most important person in the history of that country and why, he will immediately say, Ben Gurion. He had courage, he had wisdom, and he was a realistic man. He knew his way and he knew how to lead the people to the targets in the most I would say, realistic way to achieve the last goal. Remember that in 1942, there was a Jewish Zionist conference in New York, and Ben-Gurion, in this gathering in 1942, passed decision that target of the Jewish people through this Second World War, that at the end of it, to achieve a state to the Jewish people in Palestine. And he was opposed by many. Also, most of the Jewish people were afraid to declare something like this, and he did it. With Ben Gurion, Rafi Aitan has had other experiences. In the early 50s, Ben-Gurion resigned from the government and settled in his democrat at the time in the desert. And he went out of the office with nothing. That means uh, he had no car, uh, no driver, and uh, the head of the intelligence uh, uh, organization at the time, Israel gave me the duty to supply Ben-Gurion for about two years with logistics. Everything, cars, drivers, 
etc., etc. And many times, uh, if we needed the driver, I was the driver. <laughs> I was uh, chatting with him uh, <laughs> up and down, up and down. And even later in life, in the 60s, 10 years later, I joined him uh, to Burma, you know, uh, to study Buddhism. <laughs> I was with him also. Anti-Semitism is a subject that is impossible to skip when speaking with Rafi Aitan. When you say anti-Semitism, you mean hate against Jewish people, not against the Semitic race, because the Semitic race are also the Arabs there. But uh, the anti-Semitism doesn't include Arabs, only Jewish people. It was spread at the beginning in the world because of Christianity. It stayed, in a way, up to this culture. The Chinese are not anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is the, in most uh, Christian countries, though the Christianity and the Jewish people, in, to my opinion, are very close religions. Rafi Aitan remains present in Israel and the world with his statements to the press. Many have commented on his statements about the immigrant situation plaguing Europe. The source of immigration, at least in the last 10 years, were from Muslim countries to Europe. Most of the immigration. Though you had uh, another kind of immigration from Burma to China or to India. I say that the family of the nations that have uh, stability and some sort of democracy in some sort of uh, logic minds, that means the European nations, the United States, including Russia, okay, and uh, including India, and including Japan uh, or South Korea, uh, they should establish some organization to deal with refugees. And for Europe, I say, it's very, very dangerous to accept the Muslim refugees without control and without selection. It's much better for you, for the stability of the world, stability of Europe, the immigration from Muslim countries will be settled in Muslim countries. That will cost a lot of money, but it's, it will, at the end, it will be much cheaper than <laughs> uh, what they, they do in Europe itself. How Israel has managed to survive while being surrounded by so many enemies and how it has become one of the most successful countries in the world, Rafi Aitan says. Dedication and uh, willingness and uh, devoting all your energy, all your uh, brains to establish the state and to protect it and to develop it. Israel is surrounded by more than 400 million Arabs. The majority of the Arabs are not accepting the fact or the right of Israel to exist. 
all along the history of Israel from 48 till now, we are our there surrounded by terrorist organization. At the beginning, it was the Fatah and the Popular Front. After it became the Islamic terrorist organization. After it, it was Daesh, which is existing now. And we had fought till now, if I'm not mistaken, five very significant wars with Arab countries. So we have to survive under sword. We have to survive and to defend ourselves in our hands. Yes, it's true that the United States, at the beginning, even states in Europe, uh, we have been helped by them. Ammunition, logistics, etc. But the main work was done by ourselves in order to survive, in order to live, in order to have normal life, you have to be on the watch 24 hours, seven days a week. It was true in 1948 and it's true in 2018. Now, the intelligence services are providing the materials, are providing the, I would say, the contents of what the army, the police, the air force, the navy are busy with. And till now, in a very successful way, but we paid and we are paying a very, very expensive price. I don't know how to explain the myths of the Mossad in the eyes of others, but uh, I would say that Israel fights for its life. And when you fight for yourself and for your life, and you believe in what you do, you have big achievements. So if you compare the Mossad or the Israeli other secret services to, let's say, to the British or American or English secret services, they are not a danger. Russia is not a danger. The United States of America is not a danger. Israel is a danger, day and night. Whilst we are speaking today, something can happen in two hours from now. So we have to be good. We have to be more than good. We have to be excellent. And this is why we achieve, not because we are wiser. We are not. We are fighting for our life. If there were not security agencies in Israel, Mossad, Shabak, the police, you couldn't live really in security and go freely in the streets or uh, take your car and go to a place just as a visitor or a, a tourist. The importance of the security uh, organization are tremendously high and I think that every boy and girl, every person in Israel knows it. The security of Israel, we need many kind of people. People like me to fight from the tanks and to protect the country of many countries, many uh, wars. And we need people, uh, secret people, classified. They know many things about uh, Israel and they know many things how the enemy of Israel try to uh, work against us. And Rafi Etan, he is the man that uh, uh, nobody know what is exactly doing, but I know that he is uh, with his system. He found a way to to give security for the country. On the future of Israel, Rafi Aitan says, "In the university, I did some work on the future of mankind, and I said because of." the nuclear power and because of communication the world must have one world government with one police force with one army and uh, one government of course 
uh, and I felt that, that uh, when I studied, that that would happen within a uh, hundred years, and I said, if this would not happen, maybe mankind might destroy its own world. When someone lives through so much in one life, there is one inescapable question. Does one regret something they did not do? I felt sometime that I should jump into politics much, much earlier. And I didn't do it because many reasons. I jumped to politics when I was 79 years old. And I became a minister when I was 80 years old. And I felt uh, the time that I should do it when I was 60. Till day that I remember Rafi that he was a politician and then a minister and uh, he used to come and to visit me in my office when I was the chief of the uh, director of the uh, service. And he didn't hear you and he always was using his hands to reach my cigarettes. And I used to take the cigarettes back and he's coming. I mean, he was a, really a character. Back in 2006, he has established a, a party by the name of Gil for all people. And uh, surprisingly, he got seven members out of 120 members of the Israeli parliament, of the Israeli Knesset. He was a great friend of Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon was a hero for him, and he was a hero, Ariel Sharon. So if he could have uh, 1,000 Ariel Sharons and 1,000 Rafi Aitans, I will go to sleep quietly. Rafi Aitan is a skilled sculptor. From childhood, I played with the uh, mud, you know, and uh, made sculpture in mud, sand. Uh, I played with the uh, figures, with sand or with some uh, other materials. And uh, I found that um, uh, for me, the sculpturing was some safety valve. If I could uh, <laughs> use these words. Uh, because my work was already, or in most of the time, under tension. And when I was sculptured, I free the tension. And that's I called the safety valve. What? Besides a trove of secrets one must keep to himself, is particularly important for someone in his line of work. I have uh, three, one girl and two boys, and I have uh, seven grandchildren. And for me, the family, it's uh, very important because it's a part of uh, my life no doubt, and I feel that should be a way of life of everybody, that uh, he lives his life with the, inside the family. And that's what I'm doing. It gives you uh, stability, I would say. Safety valve for your mind. When you ask him about love, Rafi Aitan is very brief. <laughs> I leave it to you. <laughs> the State of Israel this year celebrates its 70th year of existence. Many despised and humiliated Jewish refugees achieved the dream of countless generations. Next year in Jerusalem, 
The foundation of the State of Israel is built around several simple words. Longing, love, passion, and faith of many who gave their lives toward this one goal. This too continues to be embedded inside so many of those who remained living and whose knowledge and abilities helped sustain the evolving progress of Israel as a nation. Rafi Aitan is the very last living legend among the few remaining magnificent pioneers of what in 1948 seemed like a mission impossible, a dream that could never come to life. But despite all odds, it did come to life. Everything Rafi Aitan did and could do, he wove into the success of his beloved homeland. He's thinking out of the box. Even when, when he's making mistakes, he's making mistakes that ordinary people will not do it. So he is very original, uh, very creative. Uh, a brave guy, a very brave guy. He is very friendly. He knows how to deal with people. He knows how to lead people. He sees always what's the main issue at a certain time. And he is not living on the past. You know, there are many uh, politicians and leaders that are saying nostalgia is the most important thing. Rafi looks always, even if he's in old age, he's looking for the future. I love this guy, and I wish that Rafi will not be the only one who thinks day and night about his country, about Israel, about the future of Israel. And I uh, can only say that if there were 1,000 Rafi Eitans in Israel, I'd be happier. He was the smartest, the sharpest, and the most experienced person in the community. And had I been asked today to appoint or to assemble a group of best people to run the country, at this age, you would still be one of them. The smaller he looks, the greater he is. <laughs>